I guess I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Lisa Forrestell, and um, in no particular order, I'm a voice here, and I work with the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, and I kind of have a serious passion around bringing hearing voices to the United States, and so that's why I'm really, really pleased to have the opportunity to spend some time with you all and um, have a great conversation about hearing voices. Um, my telephone line and, and my, my presence, when I'm lucky, is shared with Marty. This is Marty Hatch. Hi, um, I was somebody who's had the experience of hearing voices, was very wrapped up in uh, the traditional mental health system for many, many years, and uh, was fortunate enough to come upon a hearing voices group within walking distance of my house. And it's really changed my life, and now I work for the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community and I'm a community bridger. I get to go into the same institutions I used to be confined in and uh, share some experience, strength, and hope with folks. So we have, um, I guess we have about an hour with everybody. And we did um, offer a PowerPoint. I'm not sure where that is, Ron. So if you can wield your magic on your end. Woohoo. Thank you. Um, do I have um, control over it on this end, Ron? I believe you should be able to, yeah, use those little arrows down the lower left. There you go. Thanks so much. So when, when we're talking with your education committee about offering this, this webinar, we were thinking very much about offering kind of the basics or the, uh, an overview of the Hearing Voices Network. Um, we, in further conversation, it felt a little bit more like maybe a lot of folks knew a lot about the Hearing Voices Network and had some other stuff going on. So we are going to offer the overview probably in a little bit of an abridged form. And then hopefully if the technology is going to co cooperate with us, we'll have an opportunity to do questions and answers and, and um, maybe share a little wisdom that's on this call today. So would you like to jump in here? Yeah. So when we talk about, yeah, sorry, there was a loud noise outside. We're on a main street. <laughs> so when we talk about uh, hearing voices network, it's really important to let everybody know that that term, hearing voices, is an umbrella term. And included in that uh, experience can be having visions, seeing things. It can be um, having weird sensations, physical sensations. I'm, I'm somebody who has you know, had past trauma stored in my body that way, where I didn't have a conscious memory, but I would see somebody and it would stir up a particular physical sensation you know, in my body. Uh, sometimes people have experiences of smelling different things. Uh, lots of people I've met and um, have had this experience of things just not tasting right. So it's more of a very broad term. Also, lots of folks can come to the groups who just have really unusual beliefs, you know, whether they believe somebody's reading their mind or putting thoughts in their heads or there's something going on with the electromagnetic waves or whatnot. So it's really broad. It's just hearing voices was kind of a back at you phrase because that is one of the most stigmatized uh, experiences out there. All of these, all these sensory pieces came, came under the, the umbrella of the Hearing Voices Network. And I guess I'll take the opportunity to also add that the network is not exclusive um, in any way. So not only are, is it all sensing experiences that we have that others next to us may not be sharing, but it's also everybody who's part of this movement has a passion about it, whether they are voice hearers or not. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about the different influences the network has had over the last quarter of a century. And they come not only from voice hearers, but from a lot of clinical folks as well. Um, and families are taking a much more active role as we head into our next quarter century. So it was really important for me to meet a bunch of people who are actually willing to hear what my experience was. 
I, I would go to the psychiatrist and talk about something and the, the answer I would get is it's not real. As if somehow that was a solution or somehow that was going to stop it. Or also telling me it wasn't valid and somehow it was bad for having that experience. And uh, I can remember uh, going back to the group and saying, you know, I told the guy this and he just told me it wasn't real and they were like, well, did you really hear it? And I'm like, yes. And so then I ended up calling him up and saying, you know, you say it's not real, but it's pretty damn real to me. So that's kind of like the bottom line first premise is that our experiences are real and uh, that they're meaningful. Hearing voices, um, they've done research and found out that there's lots of people who hear voices who do not enter the mental health system. and. Uh, the mental health system gets a, kind of a warped view of it because they're only seeing people who are coming in in distress. The people who are navigating the experience um, aren't knocking on that door, so people weren't aware that people could navigate the experience well. Uh, learning from our experiences is way more important to learn from my experience, when does it happen, in relation to what, what is the context, than just trying to medicate it away or deny it that it's happening. Um, so hearing voices groups create a safe space in which we can talk about voices where, you know, I'm not threatened with uh, being locked up or given more medication, but instead people react with curiosity instead of fear. And no judgment is placed on anybody's experiences, which means lots of people come in with lots of different uh, ways of understanding their experience, and people don't have to agree with each other. People are respected to have, you know, whatever understanding works for them. And we might question how well is it working for them? How does this affect your, you know, daily life to, to view things this way? And um, but no one's told, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, and uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the whole idea about creating spaces where uh, voice hearers can talk together is really challenging these real, these, these real fundamental premises that are really uh, predominant in our society. And if we truly believe that this is a relatively normal experience, that it's part of, of, of human diversity, then we have to challenge all these other things and really allow people's stories to come out. So a lot of what we see in these slides and, and around the ethos and values of the Hearing Voice, Voices Network are uh, really concrete ways to keep um, a focus on that challenge to really treat the experience as just like any other experience, that we're going to be interested in what it is for somebody and what it means to somebody and how they use it in, in, in um, accordance with the rest of their lives and how they move through their lives as a result. It's really not dissimilar from, so how was your first day at school? It's going to be scary. It's going to be different. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be comfortable. It's going to be whatever it is for the person. And that's really the same thing as, as our voice hearing experience. As a voice hearer um, that doesn't really experience a lot of distress um, when, when I'm hanging with my voices or just, you know, just in the matter of course of things, that's how I've always thought of them. And when I encountered folks that really were coming from a different place, that's what scared me, um, was actually thinking that people were um, unconsciously or consciously othering me because I had an experience that they didn't share. So HPN groups hold an ethos of self-help, which, you know, is, there's, in the U.S. there's so many self-help groups, it's amazing, you know, with AA and NA, and then there's all sorts of uh, breast cancer survivors, widowers, lot, lots of self-help groups where each person is the expert of their own experience. So attending a group isn't about getting treatment or getting fixed. It's about having a safe place, safe meaning. I'm you know, not going to get uh, locked up for talking about it, but a safe place to talk about whatever that experience is. And, and that 
in of itself can be a huge relief to finally have a place to share your story and have people not freak out on you or diagnose you for it, but instead react with curiosity. So if we change these dynamics, we're creating an opportunity for something really, truly different to happen. Um, for each of us to understand that our voice, uh, our voice is in relationship to our experiences. Some of the research that's been done um, within the Hearing Voices Network suggests that that's really the only difference between people that hang uh, comfortably, relative, uh, comfortably is a, a relative term, but uh, comfortably with their vo voices versus those that express uh, distress around that experience. It really is um, how we've come to understand our experience that makes the difference. Um, that changing the relationship that we have with our voices, which is true relationally regardless of whether their voices are actually corporeal people, if we don't feel like we have any power in a relationship, that relationship is going to be distressing to us. And that's often the case with um, the relationship that does or does not exist with our voices. So having that opportunity to talk about it that way, rather than it being something wrong, it's actually something that can be worked on, something that can be changed, and something that you can have power in. And then supporting folks in paths of their own choosing, I think is really, really super important. Um, while I didn't um, have therapy or psychiatric treatment or anything for my voice hearing, um, other aspects of my uh, emotional content were described to me by others and, and folks told me what it was for me rather than giving me the space to figure out what it was for myself. And that really, really um, impacted my ability to sit with my own discomfort. Um, again, it was kind of a power struggle. So if somebody else had the power to define my experience, I didn't actually have the power to change it. So creating opportunities where people can actually consider what that power might be, saying no to a voice, asking a voice to wait for another time to talk, to, talk with them, um, asking meaning what the voice means, um, all these things, thinking about the time of day in which we, ha we hear our voices and the content and what other stresses we might be under at the time, all offer us great opportunity to make meaning of our experience and see things in a really different light other than illness and brokenness. An amazing thing happens, too, in these groups is that people start identifying strengths in each other. So instead of having a real deficit-based looking at somebody, it's like, wow, Marty, you went through all that and you're, you're still walking around. How did you do that? And then people can share the strategies that they had, and uh, it helped me to see that, you know, instead of just thinking, you know, I'm just messed up, it was like, you know, I, I did learn some survival skills, and maybe some of those things are not serving me well now, but I do have some strength and capability to, to handle things that come up. So I'm going to give you the short version of the story, and um, I was a kid who got born into uh, very adverse conditions. It was a, it was a tough uh, environment. My mom lived in a basement of a house, a multi-family house. She had, a, I had two older siblings, one two and one four, and my dad was away at school, school a lot. And um, she was pretty overwhelmed trying to do this stuff. And I had made friends with one of the people who lived in the house, and uh, that person treated me like I was special, you know, would have real conversations with me, thought, you know, what I said was important, would buy me ice cream, so I got all this one-on-one -on -one attention that I was not getting in my house, and uh, then on a particular day, the, this person, this neighbor hurt me, and uh, it was really uh, hard for me to understand how somebody I could be so special to, could ignore me when I told them to stop, it hurts. And, you know, in that moment I had become not a special person but an object. And I went and I told my mom and she got very angry and I really couldn't tell if she was angry at me. I just knew it wasn't good when my mother was angry and uh, she told me don't ever go up there again. 
And so maybe a month or so passed and I had this uh, night where I just felt really disconnected and uh, wanted to be special again. And I went to go up the stairs and that's when I had my first vision. And what I saw was four figures at the top of the stairs and uh, they represented death. And I stood there and waited for them to leave because I really wanted to go up and I uh, didn't leave. And then I took a step up the stairs and they came closer. And they were able to communicate to me in a way that my mother's words were not. And it was, you know, they were telling me, if you go up there, you're going to die. And in retrospect, I can say, you know, yeah, I wouldn't have physically died, but maybe spiritually I would have lost something if I had gone up there. But as a little kid, that vision was really helpful. Uh, a second vision I had was, I had had a bone graft and gotten infected. I was in the hospital unexpectedly over Christmas. And what other people saw was this woman in a white dress with all her helpers handing out presents. And what I saw was an angel. And she had light all around her. And when she got close enough to me, that light touched me. And in that moment, I felt this love and uh, good energy or this idea that something positive and good existed in the world, that there was this big good thing out there, which I just wasn't feeling otherwise. And it was really a, a neat experience for me. But fast forward, you know, I had these experiences in life and as a teenager, uh, some of them became much harder to deal with and moving away from my family and trying to coexist with people who were not as chaotic as my family was. It, things got difficult. And eventually, I ended up in mental health services. And uh, I just want to give you a couple of examples of how things are different in hearing voices groups. I, uh, I had this thing where I was afraid that somebody would enter the building I lived in, go up the stairs, and come in my bedroom at night. And I would wake up, and there'd be a stranger standing by my bed. So that was my fear. It was a huge fear. I shared it with a psychiatrist, and he said, well, sounds like you're getting paranoid. Let's look at the meds. And I shared it with my therapist, and the therapist said, let's talk about your childhood. And I said, you're crazy, because <laughs> I already can't sleep, so I do not need to like start talking about that stuff. So then I went to the Hearing Voices group, and they said, that sounds really scary, Marty. What can you do? And we uh, brainstormed this plan of uh, putting pots and pans in my recycled cans on the stairs. Because they asked me enough questions to help me figure out. My fear was I would w be in bed and wake up and there'd be somebody in the room. That was what the fear was. And uh, you know, if there was noise, I would wake up before the person got in my room. So that allowed me to get some sleep and get some perspective. And um, what I eventually figured out was that something had happened in front of my house. You know, an act of violence had happened in front of the house. And uh, it had reminded me of something that happened when I was a kid. So emotionally, I had gone back to that space. So I had all this emotion, but not all the thoughts that connected. But after getting through the initial stress, I got it. And I'm going to share one more story. I had a voice that was telling me to kill myself. And um, this time I went to the psychiatrist. And I did not say I had a voice trying to kill me because that had not gotten me any kind of, quote, help that I wanted at this point. Like I had figured out, don't, don't talk that way unless you want to be locked up. So I just went in there and said, you know, I think someone's trying to kill me. And again, he said, you know, I think you're getting paranoid. Let's look at the meds. But he also said, you know, I just want you to know nobody's trying to kill you. I care about you. Nobody's trying to kill you. I went to the therapist, and uh, she said, you know, no one's trying to kill you, but she said it in a very condescending way. Oh, Marty, no one's trying to hurt you. Like, I'm being silly. And uh, I went to my family, and they actually said I was being silly. Went to the Hearing Voices group, and uh, they said, that sounds really scary again. And then they said, what does the voice say? When does it come? Who does it remind you of? Has anyone else, you know, has anybody ever talked to you that way before in your life? 
And what I figured out over time, I mean, they asked all these questions. It took me at least a month to think about all the questions. And I realized that the voice was the voice of uh, someone who had treated me very poorly as a kid. And once I realized that, the power it had kind of like disappeared. Oh, it's the same jerk who has been rotten to me forever. Big surprise. And um, so those are some of my stories. And you know, I've gone from somebody who was told that they had a serious persistent mental illness to somebody who's now you know, employed and going all over the country and generally creating a life that I feel is worth living. I'm just going to say for everybody that heard that, thanks, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> You're all muted. I, I assume there's probably some thanks going around, so I'm going to offer that because I always enjoy hearing Marty's story. I kind of like the amended form. Yes. Yeah. I, I, well, the short and sweet, but there's the background for me. So um, for those of you that would like to hear more about M Marty's story, he is on YouTube. He did, a, he did a, a little bit more extended talk. And I think you can just look for either his name, Marty Hadge, or the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, and you'll be able to find out a little bit more about his story. Um, but I always enjoy hearing his his. He's got a great storytelling ability, um, which hasn't always been the case. I, I used to not have words. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that's one, that's one of the most amazing things. I, um, I've, I've known Marty now for five years. Yeah, probably, probably about five years. And um, when I first mar met Marty, uh, he had he had been sitting in on on hearing voices on a hearing voices group, but sitting in would be about it because he wasn't really ready to take part yet. And it took him a while to uh, build up a place of trust with that group. Um, and I would say that that group earned his trust over time. And um, one of the the cool aspects of that particular group was that there were professional people in the room and people that didn't identify with the experience. Um, but each one of those people to a person was curious about who Marty was as a person and held an understanding that Marty would get to a place where he would want to share that. Um, and I think that's really the mark of a top-notch hearing voices group when that happens. And so I... Uh, really do appreciate hearing that story. Uh, what I'm going to try and do now, I was just looking through the slides and trying to figure out how I want to play with my own storytelling ability, but I'm going to offer a little bit of history of the Hearing Voices Network um, in the USA and overall uh, hop in the pond back back to the UK and the Netherlands. And um, it's a grand, grand history. One of the things that we use uh, the uh, statements that we use here in our community a lot is, is a reference to the shoulders upon which we stand. Knowing our history is really super important. Um, some people talk about it through familial ties and, and language, talking about family. Um, some people talk about it as our tribe. There's lots of different ways to talk about our history, but the Hearing Voices Network really is um, a, a familial kind of history. Um, the folks that started uh, started to hatch the idea around what the Hearing Voices Network would eventually become uh, are still really, really active in the network. And, and we, every time, one of the things, we have a, um, a facilitator that, that hosts a really, really awesome group. And one of the things that she always makes a point to mention is that regardless of whether our conversation is just starting or just ending, there's a conversation about hearing voices happening somewhere around the world all the time these days, and it's because of the shoulders upon which we stand. Slides do here. Um, the story is a really, really interesting one in that that whole idea of challenging our concept and our understanding of what voice hearing is um, was how this all started, how it precipitated. And it was a partnership between a voice hearer and a, a soci sociologically trained psychiatrist uh, that really led 
to what we now understand as the Hearing Voices Network. I wanted to introduce you to a couple active participants in the network these days. A number of you may have run into Eleanor Longden on a TED Talk. She has offered her story on a TED Talk, which has gotten a really amazing amount of publicity. If you haven't seen it yet, please find it. It's a, a great 20, 25-minute uh, talk. And she's, we've been lucky enough to have her over here, too. So um, that's another piece. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this as far as uh, ISPS. But uh, having the opportunity to bring international folks uh, into our, our, our more localized world is a really great way to spread the word about hearing voices. Joe is a poet and activist. I love these cards because they actually offer that we are entire people and not just our experience. Jackie Dillon is a trainer and an activist, and I was she she kind of uh, she lit my fire as far as the Hearing Voices Network in in a single evening when she told her story and recognized that I possibly had a story of my own that I'd share one day. And Ray Waddingham is is another. Fabulous mover and shaker with a great accent. Um, her hair is currently pink. That, that picture is out of date. Um, but she is uh, an amazing, she's an activist. Like, she's got manager here, which I think is a, 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 you get to call yourself what you want. But she is one powerful person. Um, and she's currently training internationally uh, in the Hearing Voices movement around what it is to be able to sit with and uh, make meaning of violent voices, uh, how to work with kids. She's developed uh, uh, hearing voices networks in penal systems. She's really done some amazing stuff. And all of this as, as a really, uh, she, her story around her voice hearing experience is really, really pivotal to, I think, really an impetus as to how she's able to engage with folks. and. Um, be a part of this movement. Not quite sure why this little bit is showing up at the bottom of this slide, but it is. Um, all of these folks, I, I would say that the, the folks that we just covered in these slides have the, the, the one that I know that's been a part of the network for the longest has been probably about 15 years or so, and that would be Jackie. And she really had a lot to do with the, the foundational pieces of the network in London in the UK, where there are currently over 60 uh, groups active. They take place in all kinds of different places. So some of them are in more traditional mental health settings, but a lot of them are in community settings. And they are driven by the people that show up. So they all have different characters. They all take on uh, different uh, projects as far as how they come together and with whom and what time all in an effort to, to support folks in understanding their experience. I'm going to pu pull up the rest of these little pieces here. This gives you a little bit of a, a timeline for the development of hearing voices in the US. Um, I mentioned earlier psychiatrists and the voice hearer that really started the hearing voices uh, movement. And that was back in the 80s. Actually, it was just, it was just at the turn of the late 70s into the 80s when Marius became a, a, a therapist and psychiatrist to Patsy Hogg, who had found herself in a, a locked unit after some really, really distressing experiences with her voices and honestly her life overall. Um, she was having a really tough time. She was uh, I, really thinking actively about suicide and really finding that she couldn't cope with her experience anymore. She'd been a voice here for the better part of her life as she remembered it. And for the most part, she'd been able to have that experience in, in keeping with her other experiences in her life. She was a middle-aged woman. She'd been married. She had kids. She'd been holding down a job. She would pretty much looked like all the rest of us um, because she was. And when things got difficult in her life, when her marriage fell apart um, and a, a number of other stresses entered her life, uh, the voices became very overwhelming. And um, she found herself obliged to kind of talk to Mary, Marius, I think. Um, Marius is, is trained as a, a social psychiatrist, so she, he doesn't, while he doesn't uh, jump automatically 
to illness and medication. That is kind of how he's been clinically trained. And so he really did help uh, do his best to help Patsy within that very traditional framework, um, part of which was insisting that her experience was a hallucination, that it was a figment, um, that it wasn't a real experience. Um, and while he was able to see that the relationship that he had with Patsy was not helping her out, was not really being supportive to her, um, it was the only way he knew to be with her. Um, she finally challenged him around that continuing uh, statement that her voices weren't real, um, stating that if, as a Christian he believed his God could possibly speak to him, then why were the voices that were speaking to her unreal? And um, while he didn't take on to that topic right away, he did go home and he thought about it for a while. Um, Patsy continued to really struggle in the hospital, um, and he really had to challenge himself about what things were working for him in his practice and what things were not. Um, he came to the hospital one day to find Patsy hanging out with a bunch of people and talking to them. Uh, this was at a point in their relationship where they were not talking very much at all anymore. And she was having a very casual conversation, maybe even laughing. She was doing that with other voice hearers. And so they tried to figure out how that could happen more often. And Patsy and Marius um, really worked to allow space for folks to talk about their experience, the entirety of their experience, whether it was about voice hearing or, or just uh, the mundane aspects of one's day, that that contact <coughs> and that continuity and that shared experience was really, really important to her well-being. She managed to get out of the hospital after a while. Uh, they partnered further with um, a woman who would become Marius' wife eventually. Her name is Sandra Escher. And Sandra was a journalist at the time and had some contacts in journalism and got them a gig on a talk show, rather like Oprah or Donahue or something. And Patsy and Marius went on a talk show and they talked about hearing voices. And they talked about it like Marty and I have been as, as a usual experience that may be unusual to some, but those of us who are experiencing it, we get kind of used to it after a while. And they had a lovely talk show. And the really interesting part of it was, was not only did they talk from their frank place about what their experiences had been together <coughs> and what, uh, what Patsy's was as she was moving through it, but they asked folks to call in. They asked specifically voice hearers to call in. And they had an opportunity to um, call approximately 400 voice hearers back um, and give interviews to them and find out what their experience was like. And that's where they found that two th up, upwards of two thirds of voice hearers, and sometimes the figures shift a little bit, it's one third to two thirds of voice hearers, um, had never engaged with psychiatry because they didn't find their uh, experience distressing. That led to great things. So many folks coming forward as voice hearers led to the, to the first voice hearing Congress in 1987. And, and a lot of groups, there was, there was some folks that showed up from the UK, Paul Baker being one of them, and he popped back to the UK insisting that, that more hearing voices groups happen. And so that's really ha the, very, the very basis of our network. Um, Pieces like the Maastricht technique and the Maastricht tool developed out of that <laughs> interview that, that um, Marius and uh, Sandra used to find out more about our experiences. Voice dialogue has um, kind of uh, evolved into a great technique that a lot of clinicians use when partnering with voice hearers and, and trying to figure out their experiences better. Um, in 2007, InterVoice online um, kind of took hold. Intervoices is our overarching, it's kind of the top, the pinnacle of our umbrella, although the idea is not um, one of control, but one of support of a very grassroots network of uh, HVN uh, countries around the world. So the countries each have their own network. And right now, I would say that there's probably 29 by my last estimated guess. Uh, the U.S. launched in 2010. We were number 26. Um, I like to chide us a little bit for being so far behind the ball. <laughs> uh, there were other efforts 
to, to come to the U.S. prior to 2010, and for one, whatever reason, they kind of fizzled out or didn't quite take hold. Um, so 2010 is kind of a, a loose date um, because I think, you know, I, I can think of, of a couple different uh, states where HVN definitely, or Hearing Voices groups uh, definitely uh, held some time. And then the latest thing which I have on this slide is, is that Connecticut has, has done a really, really cool job of creating a, a formalized supportive network um, to really help the hearing voices groups uh, in their sustainability. And it's an interesting model, and I think anything that gets considered a model, will you can, you can kind of uh, test it and find some flaws or some pieces that may not work in your neck of the woods, but the Connecticut Hearing Voices Network has been really, really interesting. There's, I think there's like 15 groups? Yeah. There's, there's about 15 groups there right now, and they're being held mostly in community settings, but there are some that are, are in more formalized mental health settings, and they are held by uh, both voice hearers and those that consider themselves allies to voice hearers. The amazing thing about Connecticut was they intentionally did this statewide launch, and they had the support of their, uh, their Department of Mental Health they call it DEMIS, and it was really neat to have uh, people, you know, a traditional mental health system uh, support a grassroots movement, and that is really neat. So that, that slide really is kind of the history slide. Um, the one thing I want to add to it is that this really has been a collaborative effort by um, an amazing assortment of people that have just taken up the cause of creating different spaces and creating a different understanding around the hearing voices experience. So I, you know, I've mentioned both uh, clinical folks and voice hearers. Paul Baker, I think I mentioned uh, a little bit. He um, he neither hears voices or nor is a clinician, but this was something that spoke to him in a very passionate way, and he's been a part of the movement for for a very very long time. And so I really want to offer that there's a place in this movement for folks that are passionate about creating different spaces um, for voice hearers and trying to change the, the paradigm by which our greater society um, understands voice hearing. Oh, my story now. Um, so my story is, is kind of, I, I would be in that uh, bunch of folks that has never engaged with the mental health uh, system because of my voice hearing. So I did end up um, in the mental health system based on emotional distress. Probably by the time I was um, in college, I, I um, was the, the victim of a violent act in college. And um, when that happened, I, I found myself in a uh, I had a green card, and I, I had an entrance card into the mental health system. And um, it was really strange because I, um, I understand uh, my experience, I think uh, mostly from, from a trauma perspective. And, um, but I don't necessarily understand my voice hearing experience that way. Um, so I guess I'm going to offer that, that um, you know, trauma and, and life experience really did have a lot to do with um, my using the mental health system when I was a young adult. And it helps me a lot to understand my experience when, when I talk about um, different emotional states that I find myself in at different parts and times in my life. But when I talk about my voice hearing experience, um, even calling it my voice hearing experience doesn't feel like that's necessarily the language I would use if, if I had something better. Um, I, my earliest memories go to about the age of three, and my earliest memories include my voices. I have three voices, um, two girls and one boy, and the girls are probably, um, I don't know, three or four, they're probably about the same age as I always remembered them to be. And uh, the male voice chose 
uh, to grow up with me. And I, those words I use very, uh, really succinctly because that's what it was. He, he, he made a decision to grow up with me. Um, I consider them uh, partner souls or companions. Um, I don't understand them to be aspects of who I am. I have other internal voices and things, and that feels more like me. Um, but these folks are, are on a path with me. Um, the little girls are really supportive. They know that I'm, uh, uh, I can be a very lonely person. Certainly in my childhood, um, I, was, I was a Navy brat, so I was uh, overseas with my family in a very foreign land. We were in Thailand. Uh, so very few folks spoke English, and um, there weren't there weren't a, there was a, there weren't a lot of kids like me. Um, so it was me and my brother on a compound with a lot of servants. Um, it was a pretty lonely existence. And my girls definitely keep me company. They're funny and they're silly, and they remind m remind me of my playful side. Um, and then my male voice is. Um, I don't even know what I would describe him as, but he keeps me real. Um, sometimes he can, uh, well, he, he always finds a way to surprise me. Sometimes he surprises me just by staying quiet. <laughs> so he's a, I, I really admire his way to, uh, his ability to communicate with me. Um, that said, none of us always get along, so there's sometimes disagreements and whatnot, but um, it's always been all of these relationships that I have have been really, really useful to me throughout my life. I have other experiences that involve uh, tactile and visual uh, taste and you know sensory experiences that feel relatively separate from these three souls, um, but definitely fit into the umbrella understanding of the hearing voices um, network. Um, the one thing that I wanted to offer is that um, when we came back to the States and I entered uh, the, the public school system, I got some really, really harsh negative mem uh, uh, messages about my voice hearing. And I was told very clearly that my little friends couldn't come to school and that kind of stuff. Um, not only was I feeling completely othered just because I was a kid from Thailand and all that stuff, but that was probably some of the harshest stuff that I had, that, that happened to me. And um, my voices and I had a conference at that time, and, and we decided to closet our experience. And so from that time forward, my voices chose to be quiet when I was with people. Um, and and um, we would talk at other times, which actually kind of led to me still being a lonely person, <laughs> but <laughs> didn't always have a lot of friends. But I had the ones that I'd always had, and that was really important to me. Um, when I met Jackie Dillon, um, it was time to have another conversation with my voices and see if it was okay to talk about us and to kind of come out, as it were. And um, that's kind of why I get to be here on this call today and talk about the Hearing Voices Network. Um, it was not a unanimous decision, by the way, um, but we did we did decide to, to kind of live out loud, and it's been a really, really awesome decision. And it's the kind of thing that that happens in hearing voices groups and in, in open dialogue where people can understand and communicate about their experience from their own place rather than somebody else's framework. Um, the groups that I have been in have really honored me with the trust and, and um, the space to not only hear my story but to tell me theirs. Um, and I've grown in just immeasurable ways hearing everybody's stories. So. Um, that is my story. Um, I think what we did in, in Marty offering some of his story and, and me was give you an idea about some of the different ways um, voice hearers have their experience. It's going to be different for everybody. Some folks um, hear voices inside their head or inside their body. Some people hear them outside. Some people don't even describe it as hearing, but just somehow feeling a communication. So it will be up to you when, when you hang with a voice here to really be curious about what that experience is for them, because it's going to be different for absolutely every one of us. And as I said when I started my story, 
Um, I still don't have the words to really accurately share with you all what my experience is. And that will continue to evolve, I'm sure, as I challenge myself to different words. So I think we managed to get through this with about 15 minutes, right. 15 minutes to spare. Um, and I would really, really like to, to open this up if we don't have too many echoes or or whatever. Wrong All right, yeah, let's give it a shot. I'm going to... Um, Conference unmuted. Everybody for, for spending the time with us. I, I imagine we might get some echo, but, but maybe we'll see if we can bear with it. Um, Who, who, does anyone have a question or a comment they'd like to start with? What? Maybe as you're thinking of it, I have one. Um, I know that sometimes what happens in voice groups, like you guys talked about some really good voice groups, but sometimes um, People come in and they've already been maybe enculturated by the system or maybe they've had really scary voices and so they really don't have curiosity about the voices. There's more of an interest in how can I stop this, how can I just ignore the voices or suppress them. Um, and it's hard to get that curiosity going. Do you want to have anything to say about that? When I went to my first hearing voices group, you know, I was really rather angry because that, that was my goal was to make it stop. And when people said that was not on the agenda, I, I was not happy about it. But um, I think what happens is people ask each other questions. And eventually that, that builds my own curiosity. And, uh, and having tried so many other things and... and you know, maybe some things worked for a while and then they didn't work anymore. And uh, so maybe in a desperation, I became more willing to to try to work with it. Plus, I you know I just I spent you know 25 years hearing it was a bad thing. So it took me a while to to realize that there were people who didn't want to get rid of their voices. And it took me a while to realize to read stories of people who had negative voices and had changed those relationships. You know, I, I, you know, I was taught that, you know, it's a symptom and you need to get rid of it or else. And uh, so, you know, it took me, like Lisa said, you know, maybe a year to actually even start talking about my experience. But I had to see how it worked with other people first. And I, I think just by listening to questions and seeing how people grow and change in their understanding, changes. Uh, we, we have a thing in the training, you know, what do you say when somebody walks in and introduces themselves as a diagnosis? You know, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm a such-and-such. And, -such. and uh, so we try to reply to that. Well, what does that look like in your life? What does that mean? How does it impact you? And, uh, and you know, try to get people thinking about it that way instead of accepting this definition of what life is. A lot of times it really is about exposure. You know, if we've only been exposed to one way of thinking about our experience, uh, it's really important for us to hang on to that. I, um, I'd been exposed to hearing voices for two years before I even went to a function to find out more about it because I, I was in a very protective place. And so it really took a number of, of, of contacts with the movement to, to really uh, jog me from that place of assumed security. So it's going to be something different for everybody, but um, I think I think for both of us, folks who are really tenacious and um, consistent and supportive in it being what it needed to be for us. Okay. Um, someone else want to jump in now? You can. You can also type in questions. By the way, I noticed Diana typed in a thank you. Um, but does anyone else want to speak up with a question or comment? I, I just wanted to say that um, um, one of the ways 
that it's probably helpful is to have, like you said, have someone with lived experiences come in and 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 present their ideas and their life story to other voice hearers. Because um, I live in a community where um, medication and diagnosis are very important, um, and it's. Uh, I have a difficult challenge. I started a hearing voices group for uh, Jewish Orthodox men in my community, and that's the first of its kind. And um, the group is already close to two years, but some families still have difficulties. The families of the men who attend still have difficulties accepting that um, it's, it's, uh, it's not a matter of getting rid of the voices. They just want, they still feel they need to get rid of the voices in order to move on with their lives. So it's a continuing struggle and challenge. Absolutely, and I think something that helps change that perspective is an awareness of uh, people who are voice hearers throughout time who are respected people. So, right. like Charles Dickens and Socrates and there's all these people who managed to be influential people who self-identified as having that experience. And sometimes that helps families to lighten up. I mean, my family, it took them a long time to lighten up. <laughs> and, and more so, it had to do with uh, you know, how I uh, managed my life. And the thing with the medication is I had reached a point where it was just destroying me physically. I had a lot of weight, and I was shaking and, and falling down, and um, I was very fortunate that I had a psychiatrist who told me, he said, you know, you have to get off these antipsychotics. I don't care what happens in your life, who dies, but they are, you know, killing your neurological system. And, uh, so I was fortunate to have a prescriber tell me you need to figure out another way to walk through life or you're not going to have one. Mm. It is hard, but yeah, I, I say you know in in these groups, one of the best things that happens for us is that we hear other people's stories, and so it becomes and I'm I'm definitely throwing air quotes becomes more normal for us because we're hearing about it from a vast number of people. It's not just our own abnormality. It's not our own baggage. It's not. It's oh wait a minute, this this happens to everybody. Our families are the same way. Their, their messages are pretty much that one predominant message, and they're not attending our groups. So as our perspective starts to change, theirs is pretty much stuck with the message that they're being offered. So for folks that are open to it, you know, family-wise, we, we try to do the same things that we offer one another and, and offering 50 stories, which is lots of different stories about people who have moved through their voice hearing experiences, some of which include folks that don't hear voices any longer. Um, mm -hmm. and really starting to look at historical figures and all kinds of different people hear voices so that we all start to think of it as a more normal experience and just part of human variation. Some groups, um, I know some groups in Connecticut, in order to build trust or just to get a new group going, they, they um, read stories out of the 50 stories of recovery. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think you're on target to say, sharing the experience or having somebody come in and share the experience or reading about this experience or maybe watching a TED talk on it can be really helpful in uh, getting things going. Yeah, and uh, Hearing Voices mm -hmm. uh, folks in Connecticut have done a really good job of taking it to the street. So the public relations stuff and, and the education of the greater community has been really important to them. So there have been mm -hmm. radio programs and, and uh, forums and all kinds of opportunity for anybody who's interested to come uh, expand their understanding of what it might be and their, their, how they might be with folks that hear voices. Um, I'm seeing in the chat box here, Allison's typing in that um, she wants to start a hearing voices group in a residential facility. Um, her background is sociology and counseling and she's a clinical therapist. She's interested to hear people's thoughts about how to begin one and what the essential elements are. 
I, I think that uh, the Hearing Voices USA website is a great resource, and on there is a charter that goes through the values of groups, and it sounds like a group that you'd be setting up would be an affiliated group. And so the, the trick is, you know, how do we create a, a place where people can do peer support or self-help in a clinical setting? So that's the challenge. And um, I, I personally have done that on a locked unit, but, you know, there's a lot of negotiation going on, and, uh, and people, you know, if, if I'm going to a group and I thought people were taking notes, and other people were going to see them and make decisions about how much medication I should be on, then I would not be, you know, likely to share in that group. So there's all these different uh, factors, but I think going to the, the website and looking at the material, there's also a, uh, an email address that you can uh, write to and, um, you know, and give your thoughts and people will, will, you know, get back to you. I think if you can get yourself to a facilitator training, that that is best, because then you actually get to practice different scenarios and uh, get to learn from other people's experiences and trying to set up groups. Yeah, I really appreciate what you're trying to do, Allison. Um, a lot of us don't have the choice about our location, so these groups really, really need to happen everywhere. Um, the, the email address at uh, Hearing Voices USA is info at um, hearingvoicesusa.org. And if you email us just kind of um, the framework that you're operating under and the concerns or questions you have about it, we'll be really happy to get back to you. Um, also, we have a, a monthly facilitators uh, call, the support facilitators. Um, so we hear about all kinds of stuff, a lot of shared wisdom around starting groups, maintaining groups, uh, intriguing situations that happen in groups, all that stuff gets discussed during that call. And that's on the first Friday of each month. And if you uh, touch base with us at that email, um, we can give you the details, the call-in number, and all that for that. The facilitators from out of Connecticut also yeah, so the last call that we were on, actually there was a, a, a good number of the facilitators from Connecticut, um, the bunch of us and then a couple from, from various states. I think there was seven or eight folks on the call. Good to know about it. And how do we contact you through the, what is the, how do we contact you? Yeah, um, yeah, let me see. I'm, Marty's reminding me that there's a last page. <laughs> can you, can you so see that, the, the, the WW Hearing Voices USA? Yeah, yeah so that's the, that's the uh, website. And then info at hearingvoicesusa.org is the email. Um, mm -hmm. And while we're, we're currently at the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, both of us are, are really invested in Hearing Voices USA. So we, we help out there on a volunteer basis a lot. So that's why we're plugging them, <laughs> plugging us. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Um, do we have a minute for another question or something? Anybody um, either spoken or type it in? <laughs> Well, um, we sure want to thank you all for making this space available for us. We really appreciate it. Um, I sure hope that everybody got um, the information that they were looking for or maybe just got tweaked and are really curious and are going to come up with questions after this. Um, again, feel free to hit us up email-wise, and we'll do our best to support those. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and it's it's yeah. great to hear your take on it. And I've been around it for a bit, but I still heard a few um, new angles. And I just think um, this thing of actually getting into what people's actual experience is, and like you said, it can be tremendously varied. But it's really different than standing way back and just having a theory like, oh, it's not real, or oh, this is what you have to do. Instead, it's like jumping in and 
kind of like, well, what is your experience exactly? And gee, I wonder what you could try. And um, and getting right in the present with people and it's exciting stuff. So thanks for sharing your take on it. Thanks for having us. All right. All right. Also, thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you. Bye. Very inspiring. Thanks very much. Our pleasure. If it was a different format, we could hear yours too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye bye. 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 Take care, everybody.